Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to day two of the Scientific Forum. Our ranks are a bit thinner this morning. Usually we have the evening reception as an excuse for that. We don't have that uh, this time around, but uh, <laughs> many of us have other reasons at the moment. So great to have all of you with us who are here in the room and also a very, very warm welcome to our online audience. Great to have you back with us as well. Just a quick uh, housekeeping uh, hint to those who are in the room. Please be so kind as to fill out the forms in the, on your seats or on your desks that tell us who you are and that you've been here. That is part of the health regulations so that we can be sure to keep everybody healthy and safe. We had a far-reaching discussion yesterday during day one of the scientific forum about the advantages associated with nuclear power when it comes to addressing a climate crisis that is exacting an increasingly severe toll on our environment and also on our economies. And as we heard from an outstanding lineup of scientists, policy makers, and experts, nuclear can play a key role in decarbonizing not only our energy systems, but also industrial sectors in which abatement is difficult and costly. Now, on the second day of the forum, we want to ask what could tip the balance further in favor of nuclear power? How can we boost its share in the world's clean energy mix? To answer that question, we begin today in session three by drilling deeper on a topic that we also touched on yesterday, namely the crucial role of innovation. But this time around, we want to take a look at how technological advances are influencing the sustainability and the safety of the entire life cycle of nuclear power, from fuel production and use to waste management. Later on, in session four, we're going to take a look at potential barriers to expanding nuclear's share in the clean energy mix and ask how the IAEA can help overcome them in its support and cooperation with member states. Before we begin focusing on nuclear power specifically, let's start with the big picture and talk about the energy life cycle as a whole. To accurately compare and combine different sources of energy, we need ways that we can conceive and measure the sustainability not only of each individual component, but also of all taken as a system, a holistic system. This groundbreaking approach is known as life cycle assessment, and our first speaker is well known for his expertise in applying it to variable renewable energy sources. It is a pleasure to welcome, live here in the hall, Gerfried Jungmeier. He's a researcher at the Joanneum uh, Research Life Institute for Climate, Energy, and Society in Graz, here in Austria. So if you would, please join us here at the podium. Great to have you with us live. Okay, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here in live. Um, I come from Graz, which is just a two and a half hour train ride from Vienna here, so it was easy for me to make it. Today I'm going to tell you about variable renewable energy sources and about the innovation in life cycle management towards a climate-friendly lifestyle. In one of the presentations yesterday, we already heard once the word lifestyle. In my presentation, you will hear it a little bit often. Um, there is really a need, a strong need, to reduce greenhouse gases. We know that the temperature is increasing, and therefore we have to reduce CO2 emissions significantly. And if we look on the main factors influencing the CO2 emissions, we end up with four factors influencing the total greenhouse gas emission. The first factor is how much greenhouse gas emissions do you emit to provide a certain amount of energy. The second factor is how much energy do you need to provide a service or a product. Number three is how many services and products per capita 
do we need? And last but not least, of how many people are we talking? And this formula, at least, we have to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. So if one of these factors is going up, the others have to compensate to keep it down. On the other hand, if we are able to reduce one of these factors to zero, for example, no greenhouse gas emission for energy service, the whole system will have zero emission. And this is at least the background of the research we do at Yoneum Research in Graz, because these two factors here, they describe the future energy system. And I'm a mechanical engineer, and so this is the focus of my activity. And my colleagues, they work on the other two factors. It's about the lifestyle. And I'm convinced that both of them have to contribute to solve problem of greenhouse gas emissions and to come to a greenhouse gas-free future. Um, when we talk about future energy systems, um, at least we want to provide energy services, and that we can do by using renewable energy services. And renewable energy sources, some of them are variable, like photovoltaic or wind. Hydropower is not so variable, mainly between summer and winter. And biomass, at least, is a kind of storaging of renewable energy, and then use it when you need it. But on the other hand, you also need other, other factors to provide an energy service. So if you have clean electricity and you put it in a train, of course, this is more efficient and less greenhouse gas emitting compared to put it in an electric vehicles. And the good thing is you can trade between these two factors. And I'm also strongly convinced that we have to put more efforts on the energy efficiency of our system and not only providing more renewable energy. And the other part is about, life cycle, uh, about lifestyle. And lifestyle, the focus is the people are the focus of that research and what we need in daily life. We need food, we need a house, we need information, we need mobility, we need products and services. And also at the skiing here, of course, we want to have recreation and, and holiday. And if you look in the statistics to see how big are the greenhouse gas emissions of the Austrians, you might end up see that the average Austrian is having roughly nine tons greenhouse gases per capita in the year. If you split it up to the nine provinces, it looks like that the guys in Vienna, they have only four tons per capita. They seem to be more sustainable than the colleagues living in upper and lower Austria. But the whole steel industry in Austria is located in upper and lower Austria. And that says that is not a fair comparison. And you have to be aware that this national greenhouse gas emissions per capita in a global economy is totally obsolete because it just describes how much emissions occur in one country or in one province, but is not an indicator on the lifestyle of the different people living there. So what do we have to do? We have to apply life cycle assessment because only life cycle assessment is the method to really describe environmental effects, especially greenhouse gases, of different products and services. And life cycle means to include the production, the operation, and the end of life of a system, and then see how much uh, environmental effects have occurred. And this is at least more or less now an international consensus. If we talk about environmental effects, you have to apply life cycle assessment. So if you apply life cycle assessment in your daily life and you go to a supermarket and you spend a 10 euro yeah, and you get products and that product for 10 euros, they have emitted four kilograms of greenhouse gases. You don't see them in the shop, but to make them and bring them there, you have emitted four kilograms of CO2 and it's the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions compared to driving 20 kilometers with a conventional diesel or gasoline vehicle. And we see the emissions on the vehicles, but we also have to consider the emissions embedded in the products you find in the supermarket. And if you apply now the life cycle thinking on the Austrian population, on all the consumption they have, and all the things in daily light, life they need, you end up that in total, the average Austrian is having emissions between 13 and 15 tons greenhouse gas per capita and year in average. And if you look a little bit closer, you see that 40% is with our goods, with all our consumption. So if we go shopping, for example, this is one major contribution. Next is mobility with roughly 25. Food and feed and eating is 11%. And all the others are less than, than 24%. And the second important thing is that from these 13 to 15 tons, 50% occur directly here in Austria, but 50% occur somewhere else 
outside in the global economy abroad, but the services are brought to Austria and we consume, of course, these products and services. And if we talk about life cycle assessment, we have always to consider the production, the operation, and the dismantling of, of a certain thing. And, and we look on the cumulated emission you have during, during the whole system. And this might be an energy system A, where you accumulate up the greenhouse gas emission or other environmental effects over the overall lifetime. And during this operation period, for example, in the power plant where you produce electricity, you then can divide the total accumulated emissions by the energy service you have provided during operation. Another system can look like this. This could be a system where on the end of life, where you are able to reuse and recycle some of the materials you spent on the very beginning to produce them. You might get them back on the very end. So if B is lower than A, B is better. There might be also other systems where you might have a bigger effort in the dismantling system. So therefore, it's very important to really consider the whole system to make a comparison, but all the systems, of course, have to provide the same service. And there's a long, long list of different, different environmental effects, from global warming, about radiation, resource consumption, area consumption. So that's a very complex area because the environment has so many different impacts. They have to be considered or should be considered in life cycle thinking. And if we talk about renewable energy sources, what are the innovations in life cycle management we are, we are doing at Ioneum in, in Austria? Of course, for this variable power supply, photovoltaic and wind, we have to include storage system to meet the demand and the supply of the service. For the bioenergy, it's a tricky thing to really make a time-dependent counting of the CO2 fixation, storage and release. End-of-life management, of course, is very important to recycle and reuse components, materials, and maybe also energy. And finally, we need to develop strategies for climate neutrality of all energy sources, of all renewable energy sources, of all our products and uh, services. Uh, climate neutrality, uh, from a scientific point of view, climate neutrality means you should not emit any greenhouse gases in the whole life cycle. So this is a very tough thing. So no CO2, no methane, no N2O, no greenhouse gas at all in the overall life cycle, then you are climate neutral. If that is not possible, you can, of course, spend uh, some efforts to to, in other projects to fix or compensate CO2. But in all of these efforts, it's also very important the timeline when you're going to emit the greenhouse gases. The ways for realization, I think it will be a, a, a stony way, a rough way. We need climate-friendly consumption. We need products with a high quality and a long lifetime. We have to increase energy and material efficiency significantly. We have to substitute fossil energy by renewable energy, reduce direct gases in agriculture, and last but not least, there are some possibilities to store CO2 permanently. And this is my last slide guiding you, giving you some picture from Paris. Yeah? It's about climate-friendly lifestyle. Why do I show you pictures from Paris? Because we work now on low carbon lifestyle, and we have developed the word of the Paris lifestyle. And why did we create the word Paris lifestyle? Because we think the Paris lifestyle is a future, innovative, satisfying, low carbon lifestyle where you can have a good life, but with your daily life, you really fulfill the requirements of the Paris Agreement to keep the global warming significant or at least below the two degrees. So this is a new lifestyle. And the good thing of this new lifestyle is it also creates new economic opportunities because the demand for low carbon products, carbon neutral products and services will increase and that might stimulate innovation and our economic development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gerfried Jungmeier. And please take a seat, perhaps this seat, uh, if you would, and then uh, we'll come back to you shortly uh, in the Q&A. And I thought perhaps you would tell us that you call it uh, the Paris lifestyle because Graz is the Paris of Austria, <laughs> which, of course, uh, some could say it, <laughs> it to be. With that approach in mind, let us now come back to nuclear power and 
talk about the end of the nuclear life cycle because it is in fact at that stage that many questions have arisen. And I'm talking especially about the issue of waste management. As we will hear, cutting edge research is now identifying new and sustainable ways to offset challenges associated with spent fuel, for example. As Chief Operating Officer at Sellafield Limited, our next speaker is responsible for the safe decommissioning and cleanup of the like-named site, which in fact is one of the most complex nuclear and industrial facilities in the world. Joining us virtually now is Rebecca Weston. Welcome. Hello, everyone. I'm Rebecca Weston. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Sellafield Limited, which is part of the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority in the UK. In terms of innovations within spent nuclear fuel management, I'm going to talk about the UK's position uh, preparing for decades of safe wet storage of our advanced gas cooled reactor fuel from, from some of our uh, reactors here in the UK. In front of you is an image of the thermal oxide reprocessing plant receipt and storage pond uh, within which uh, our AGR fuel will be stored for the, the next 80 years uh, pending a long-term uh, disposal uh, solution. The Thorpe reprocessing uh, facility uh, completed its reprocessing mission uh, in 2018 um, and has commenced post-operational clean-out uh, and is stepping into decommissioning of elements of the, the facility. The receipt and storage pond, however, is being uh, reconfigured uh, to act as an interim store for the remaining uh, spent fuel um, within the, the UK, uh, pending emplacement of that fuel in a geological uh, disposal facility uh, on a government decision with regard to declaring fuel as waste for disposal in, in such a facility. Clearly, in order to underpin a storage regime uh, such as uh, we propose for 80 years, a robust uh, regime of condition monitoring uh, and inspection uh, is required uh, to deliver that. And I'm going to talk about some of the innovations we have already implemented and some which are underway. So perhaps what are the positives of, of wet storage? Clearly it, it supports the, the UK storage strategy uh, that the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority have laid out. Uh, one of the advantages of, of wet storage within the, the pond is that uh, there is easier access uh, to the fuel uh, as opposed to within um, dry storage casks or uh, within uh, new uh, facilities uh, if a dry regime was undertaken. Um, it allows for um, easy access for detection of, of issues and it's certainly an, an area where the UK has significant experience and, and knowledge uh, in storage of uh, wet fuel um, to date. I think also important that uh, the, the wet uh, approach and utilising um, existing facilities allows us to be flexible for future strategies, whether that's a, a change in stance uh, around the fuel cycle or being open to uh, future innovations around um, either drying or uh, long term storage of, of nuclear fuel. I should point out at this stage there, there are clear differences between light water reactor uh, and the advanced gas cooled reactor fuels. Clearly um, a stainless steel clad uh, within the AGR uh, as opposed to um, typically zircaloy for, for light water reactor fuel. Um, and each fuel channel in the reactor with the, with the stringers um, of eight fuel elements containing a, a number of, of pins each uh, means a, a different set of uh, irradiation conditions experienced as compared to light water reactor uh, assemblies and, and clearly has an impact on not just the storage regime but the, the monitoring and sampling regimes that are adopted for the different types of, of fuel. So in terms of innovations already delivered to support the strategy, uh, we have uh, 
change the the pH over over time to uh, a more alkaline um, position as a, a corrosion in, inhibitor. Um, we've looked at uh, the storage arrangement to to maximise the input within the uh, pond, and we've undertaken post irradiation post storage examination of the fuel to understand uh, the, the the fundamentals of the of the challenges uh, of storage over a significant period of time. But there is much more to do uh, around the condition monitoring and, and inspection in particular. Eddy current testing is something that's a, a well-worn um, technique in, in post-irradiation um, examination, but uh, new developments um, in this regard uh, allow us to uh, consider potential vulnerabilities of, of particular fuel types with regard to stress corrosion, uh, cracking and, and look for early signs of that. We've been using remotely operated vehicles within our legacy ponds uh, to undertake a whole range of, of activities and some of the uh, cross learning and, and transfer of knowledge from some of those programs uh, has as considering the use and using uh, ROVs uh, within our um, storage ponds. Um, sampling is a, is a good example of this uh, and it, it reduces the, the need for um, well, personnel interaction and indeed um, sample transference uh, and, and the like um, outside of the, the pond. Smart monitoring is something we're also keen uh, to further explore. It's something we consider at the moment in and use in our uh, uh, waste containers on, on dry land. It's something uh, to investigate further as to implement that effectively within a wetted environment within the pond. So to summarise uh, around some of the, the innovations uh, aligned to um, nuclear spent fuel management, uh, particularly around the, the approach of, of wet storage in the, the UK, which is uh, the, the current UK strategy for the, the remainder of the, of the AGR fuel pending transfer to um, a geological disposal facility. We need to be confident in our ability to keep um, the fuel safe and that's underpinned by data both to date but uh, continuing to explore innovations uh, around the monitoring and inspection in particular and this enables us to stay flexible for, for future developments and, and strategy changes as well. Thank you for listening. And we will have a chance shortly to pose questions to Rebecca Weston as well as to Gefried Jungmeier. Let's now stay with the question of nuclear waste and look at another challenging issue, namely geological disposal. Here too, significant progress is being made thanks to scientific and technological advances. Countries are now developing deep geological repositories, like Finland, for example, which expects to start operating its facility in 2025, so less than five years from now. It is a pleasure to hand over to the video presentation of Liiso Heikin Heimo. She's Deputy Director General for Nuclear Energy and Affairs in Finland's Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Heikinheimo. I come from the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment, the Department of Energy there. I'm responsible for the nuclear energy. My topic is progress and innovation in deep geological disposal and the case Finland. Uh, nuclear waste management policies in Finland, we can say four major rules. Uh, policy was formulated in 1983. We need to take care of all the wastes, but then it was allowed to export uh, wastes as well. This was banned in 1994, and also the nuclear waste import uh, was banned at that time. Uh, a very important uh, 
cornerstone is that utilities have the responsibility of taking care of the nuclear waste management. And this is why Fortumen TVO established in 1995 Posiva company, which is dedicated in nuclear waste management. Funding of nuclear waste management is always required for the full amount. Here is a view of the POSIVA site in front of this picture and the Olkiluoto TVO nuclear power plant site is on the top of the picture. And there you can see also the interim storage for the spent fuel in wet pools. The similar one is located in Lovisa, the other side in Finland. Uh, in the POSIVA area, you can see that construction works are ongoing. There is also the road, the tunnel into the repository ready for the, for the construction vehicles and for, for further on for all the operational needs. This is the schedule of POSIVA today. We are somewhere mid of the uh, copper canister bar here. 2020, the encapsulation plant uh, construction is ongoing. The repository works started already four years ago. And we anticipate that this construction will be finalized by 2021. And the operating license application will be sent to our ministry like one year from now or or one and a half years from now. And the operation will start around 2024 after the operating license granting. The closure of the final disposal facility will then take after around 100 years from the operation starts. And what will it include? It will include the repository final capacity, 6,500 tons of uranium, corresponding to about 3,300 capsules or canisters of, um, of spent fuel. Uh, the depth of the tunnel is uh, somewhere minus 450 meters, and the final extent will yield about two square kilometers. This means that in total about 1.5 million cubic meters of bedrock has to be excavated to build all the tunnels, uh, which will make about 60 to 70 kilometers in total. Some pictures from the site, from the construction of the encapsulation plant. On the left, there is this uh, big co concrete, uh, which is yielding the third floor of the, uh, of the encapsulation plant building. It's in fact a huge uh, hot cell itself for the encapsulation of the spent fuel and uh, closing the uh, canisters. In the middle, there will be the welding and machining station for the canisters after the fuel has been put into the capsules, then the lids are welded and machined. And on the right, uh, some more ready spaces, which are located below the ground level. From the outside of the encapsulation plant, you can see the connection to the capsule hoist chart, uh, pointed with the red arrow. And this is the path from the encapsulation plant to the repository for the copper canisters. And the capsule transport corridor is on the right side. They are very heavy components. You need uh, rails and uh, cranes to move them inside the uh, big uh, hot cell uh, building. And then from the repository underground, some illustrations on the right side, you can see the shape of the tunnel and a bit of the size of the tunnel 
These are from the central tunnels 5 and 6, these pictures. And some details from the repository works. Elevator shaft shielding has been uh, made ready. It is uh, for, for the move, moving the capsules from the top to the repository area. Also, first wall from parking area to the controlled area are in progress. And the ventilation installations are in progress. These are solid tubes for the ventilation. Uh, and what does this mean for our ministry, like the next steps? Of course, we need a positive safety assessment for the operating license application from our authorities, took both for the operation and for the long-term safety. We have some licensing issues to be decided. First, the duration of the first operating license. The licensing uh, will cover 100 years from now in total, and we need to think if we make it stepwise. Then special conditions for the licensing of operation, depending on the application, and other legal and liability issues where we need some international cooperation. As a summary, I can say we see that we have a solution for the high-level waste final disposal, and POSIVA is now realizing it for the disposal. Thank you, and thank you for your attention. And she will be back with us shortly for a Q&A. But first, we hear our last presentation in this session, which focuses on technological innovation to close the fuel cycle, thereby enabling the reuse of natural resources where possible and also reducing the toxicity of the remaining nuclear waste. Angelika Kapaskaya has been working in the nuclear industry for more than 30 years. She's currently the lead senior manager at Rosatom's project office, and she sent us this video presentation. Good morning, dear colleagues. I would like to provide you a short presentation about the place of fast reactor of this closed fuel cycle in a sustainable future of nuclear energy. We can divide fuel cycle option into open fuel cycle with direct disposal spent fuel as a waste after long-term storage, and closed fuel cycle with mono-recycling and multiple recycler or continuous recycling and breed reactors. The scientific community estimated how the type of fuel cycle affects the parameters of preserving natural uranium and red waste management. Recycling spent fuel in the, in the mono-recycling scenario, saving up to about 25 natural uranium. Uh, in multi-recycling scenario, using spent fuel in stocks of depleted uranium can save almost 100% of natural uranium resources. Differences in heat load and waste volume may have a major impact on the size of repository. The high-level waste volume is reduced significantly in closed fuel cycle options as compared to open cycle. Monorecycle has only 70% of the high-level weight volume of open cycle and multi-recycle is only 5%. The K-heat is also significantly reduced in continuous recycling options. Why fast reactor can save natural resources? The answer is in characteristics of fast spectrum and in behavior of fissile and peptide isotopes in thermal and fast neutron spectrum. Fissile isotopes can fission in both thermal and fast spectrum, but the fission fraction is higher in fast spectrum, and fertile isotopes can significantly fission in a fast spectrum. In the thermal reactors, only a small part of the energy potential of natural uranium is used. Fast reactor can convert the depleted uranium into fissile materials. As a result, the amount of energy extracted from the same amount of uranium 
is extended by a factor of at least 50. For open cycle with the current number of reactors, the total identified resource of uranium will run out after about 130 years. Fast reactor can provide energy for the next thousand years with the already known uranium resource. Uh, the long-term radiological toxicity is dominated by the actinides. Neutron balance in fast reactor is suitable for recycled transuranics. With uranium, plutonium, neptunium recycling in fast reactors and burning all the minor actinides, the period over which high-level radioactive waste remains hazardous uh, could be reduced from hundreds of thousand years down to a few hundred years, with reduction of the monitoring period of final repository to time scale within human experience and enhance public acceptance of nuclear energy. During the implementing large-scale fast reactors, nuclear energy system. The two component nuclear energy system consisted of thermal and fast reactors will exist for a long period. In Russia, the two component nuclear energy system with closed nuclear fuel cycle is a strategic goal. Fast reactor experience consists from about 20 fast reactors with more than 400 operating years. Test and demonstration reactors built and operated in US, France, UK, Russia, Japan, India, German, and China. Now two large-scale fast reactor BN600 and BN800 operates in Russia. I can also mention BIR test reactor under construction in Russia and test reactor announced for design and construction in US. Uh, Gen4 roadmap identify three fast reactor technology for consideration. Sodium cooled fast reactors, lead cooled fast reactor, gas cooled fast reactor, and many countries including Russia, US, France, Japan, China, India, Belgium, South Korea are involved in developing fast reactor technology with the relevant fuel set. Russia has a long history of fast reactor developments and operating sodium-cooled fast reactors. Now Russia operates two industrial-sized fast reactors, and this year the first serial batch of MOX fuel loaded into BN-800 coal. Next year we plan to have full coal with MOX fuel. For testing lead cooled fast reactor Brest 300 in a closed fuel cycle, uh, the experimental and demonstration energy complex now is under construction at the Siberian Chemical Combine. The complex will include Brest reactor power unit, uh, fabrication, refabrication model for mixed uranium plutonium nitride fuel, and the reprocessing model of uh, spent fuel. As a conclusion, almost all nuclear reactors under operation are thermal reactors, which don't allow a complete utilization of natural resources. A fast reactor enhance sustainability of nuclear energy utilization, and the characteristics of the fast spectrum and closed fuel cycle guarantee a potential energy supply for thousand years and the effective management of high-level waste. Fast reactor technology has been brought to a high-level technical maturity in the last decades, and many countries are engaged in the development of innovative fast reactors uh, with closed fuel cycle concept. Important research efforts are worldwide devoted to cover technological web. Thank you for your attention. 
That was our final presentation now in session three, and we want to go straight into a question and answer session, both with those in the room and also with our online audience. And once again, Jeff Donovan is with me to moderate those online questions. And we'll begin, though, with questions right here in the room, either for Gefried Jungmeier, who's with us here live in person, and or for our other speakers, all of whom are also now joining us live online. So maybe we can see them. There they are. And may I note that we have an unusual gender balance in this session. Great to see all of you. Um, so who has a question in the room, first of all, for any of our speakers? OK, not seeing any hands going up yet. It's early. There's one, please. And do tell us, if, if you would, who you are and where you come from. Uh, good morning. My name is Alexander Bychkov, representative of Rosatom. Uh, but I have uh, uh, one maybe philosophical question to Mr. Youngmeyer. Uh, your conception uh, is uh, really very attractive and progressive. But uh, more than one billion uh, people in the world has no access to any type of power. And more than one billion has, have uh, limited access to uh, power. Uh, so mainly it's, of course, in developing countries. What conception you can advise for him? The same as uh, Paris life cycle? Or maybe you have something else? Uh, I'm sorry, no, no mic there. I'll get you this one. Here you are. Uh, thank you very much for, for this question. Um, of course, the, the, the challenges we're facing on a global scale are very, very big. <laughs> so therefore, in our research, we have now a strong focus here on European lifestyle and to develop them to climate-friendly lifestyles and then see how that can be used also in other parts of, of, of the world. And, 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 and the second thing, I think it was about the heat you mentioned, how we can supply heat climate friendly or what was the question? Not only heat, not only heat. Uh, uh, in uh, many countries with high population and in developing countries, really a lot of people have no access to power. For yeah. them, it's any type of power, coal, uh, yeah. oil, it's very progressive. And they cannot live in this Paris life si life lifestyle. Yeah, uh, so this, this climate lifestyle is of course a necessity if we want to fulfill the Paris targets. And, and we work now to develop lifestyles in the technical way and also in a transformation of the current lifestyle to more climate friendly lifestyle. And there's a one very important thing is really to consider how, how people are going to live, what are the, their daily needs, and most of these things. And I personally say very often in a country like Austria or in Graz, where I come from, you have already quite today a very good possibility to have a daily life with low greenhouse gas emissions in all the different areas. Uh, if you consume products with a high quality and a long lifetime, if you use very energy efficient services which are provided by renewable energy, and so at least there are already many solutions available quite now that you're able to live a life with at least relatively low greenhouse gas emissions. And, and that is something we are trying to further develop and uh, also for, for other people, for other countries, to follow this, this way in a new, progressive, innovative economic development. Maybe I can pose a very short follow-up uh, question, which uh, kind of goes in the same direction, I think. Namely, whether you're suggesting that we can get to climate neutrality simply through renewable sources plus lifestyle changes? Yes, and it, energy efficiency and material efficiency, I think, is, is a key which is very much not in the center of our research. Yeah? So really, energy efficiency and material efficiency should be an unfair thing. And then, of course, we need renewable energy 
and of course we need a transformation in our lifestyle. And if you look on this hybrid conference, yeah, I'm the only speaker maybe being here in person and it's very possible to also make a very attractive conversation, scientific exchange, also by not traveling all people here to Vienna, but using the, the facilities. Indeed, in, that's what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that's what we're doing. And I think this is just a good example that we are really able, and there are ideas, to reduce uh, greenhouse gases. And I'm a technical guy, yeah? and I do my business for more than 30 years, and in technology, in all the areas, we made a good progress, yeah? which is eaten up by the development of the people. Now we have more efficient cars, but we drive more. We have more efficient buildings, but we have bigger buildings and all that. So we have really to focus also more on lifestyle, on the people's behavior. That's what, what we try to do. Thank you very much. Let me now ask Jeff, unless we have other questions in the room live, then I'm going to ask Jeff because I've gotten a sign that there are quite a few coming in online. So yeah, please. Thank, thank you, Melinda. We do have quite a few questions. Um, there's one on renewables, so maybe we can just continue with, uh, with our, 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 our panelists on that one and then move to the other questions. Okay, let's keep that one very brief because we don't have a whole lot of time. Okay, so, the question yeah. is about life cycle management uh, of renewable energy sources. Are there inter any uh, innovations or advances to, to note with regard to uh, uh, issues related to mining and also decommissioning and disposal of hardware and uh, elements, some toxic uh, uh, in the life cycle. Thanks. Yeah, that's that at least important for all energy systems. You always need resources to build a facility, a power plant or a heating plant. And of course, for the renewables, that even becomes more, attractive, uh, more, more relevant because most of the impacts you have on the very beginning when you install, for example, photovoltaic, and, 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 the, and, and our innovations go that you really, on the end of life, are able to recover most of the material, most of the, of, of, the, of, the, of, of, the, of the components to reuse or recycle them. So that is a strong focus to really go into a circular economy, which is still right high on our research agenda, to really close the different material cycles and reuse and recycle again and again, to reduce at least the depletion of raw materials from, from the ground. Thank you very much. Jeff, how about questions for our other panelists? Yes, so uh, we have a couple of questions about Finland and the uh, deep geological uh, repository that's being developed. I'll combine them. The um, uh, first question is uh, uh, for, for, Ms., for, uh, for Lisa Heinkenheimer. Um, what challenges, what sort of key challenges remain uh, to be resolved before the facility can go into operation? And can you tell us something about public attitudes towards this facility, particularly in the communities, uh, nearby communities? Great, that's for Lisa Heikinheimo. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the questions. And, uh, maybe I first start with the, with the question about the public attitude. In general, in Finland, we have a rather positive attitude towards nuclear energy today, and uh, especially at the uh, communities nearby the sites. Uh, there are, of course, many reasons for this, uh, this development. And uh, uh, one important reason is, is taking care of the nuclear waste. I, I think the work the companies have made for the operating waste for over 20 years now to dispose of and uh, and all all the safety measures as well for the waste management uh, they are an important part for this so this is a long term work and uh, and the situation is is today rather good but it needs to be uh, taken good care of as well so about uh, what challenges are still before the licensing uh, I, I think the construction uh, stage is rather um, like an engineering stage uh, that the, uh, major uh, decisions and developments are already in hands. But, but of course, uh, because of going into the bedrock, uh, there will be new questions uh, 
into the bedrock, uh, the natural uh, environment, and and you can't predict it exactly before. So, so this type of tools we need to develop probably continuously. And I must apologize for the talk. I said that the construction will be fi finalized when the uh, operating license application is sent to our ministry. But of course, it's continuing because it's part of the operation, the repository construction works. And, and continuous development is, is needed there. So I hope this was an answer for the questions. Thank you. Jeff, may I, uh, before we move on to other panelists, may I put in a very short follow-up question also to, uh, to Lisa, and it's this. You talked about uh, a license of 100 years. We're talking about very long time periods here, and as we know, uh, disposal sites actually measure their time frame in geological time, meaning thousands of years. So one question I would have is, what kind of plans you're making for maintaining skills, knowledge, uh, monitoring, and so on in these very long time frames? Okay, thank you for this question. I think this is this is one of the major concerns that we we have to take care already today that that the skills and knowledge need to be maintained and developed. And I think it is linked to my previous answer that uh, there is a continuous need for uh, research and development in in this field and for the repository. And this is one of the major tools. But the other fact is that uh, if we think about the licensing stepwise, we could put some steps uh, to, to enhance this uh, maintaining the skills as well. So to link these processes together. And this is the questions we are today thinking about. Thank you. Thank you very much. So back to you, Jeff. Sorry for that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there's a question uh, for Rebecca Weston in the UK. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on the studies that you were doing uh, uh, to ensure that the nuclear fuel remains safe? Uh, what are some of the challenges uh, to this? Thank you for that uh, question and good morning, everybody. Uh, in terms of uh, the studies that we're undertaking, we're clearly looking at uh, the fuel that is currently being stored in the pond. And we do have the benefit of having stored uh, material for a long period of time. Uh, so we are able to take some of that uh, material for uh, post irradiation uh, examination uh, and that, that gives us a, a good experience over um, a number of decades that we can use to predict uh, future uh, performance uh, in, the, in the environment we're, we're looking at. Uh, we're also increasing our capability in terms of online uh, monitoring and, and that is something that is, uh, that is continuing to, uh, to develop. Jeff. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, there was uh, there were a few questions on fast reactors. Uh, maybe I'll just try to pull out the main elements for them and, and pose that to our uh, panelists uh, from the Russian Federation. Um, basically, the, the questions are: uh, there only seem to be a couple of fast reactors in operation today uh, in uh, the, the two in Beloyarsk in, in Russia, and um, there have been some. Uh, programs that have not exactly uh, uh, shown, let's say, in, in several countries on fast reactors. Um, so the question is, uh, to what extent are, are, is this technology really the future uh, if uh, its use today is somewhat limited and some of the examples haven't been terribly successful so far? Thank you. Angelica? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Good morning, everybody, once again. Uh, and uh, as for answer for your question, uh, Jeff, uh, I would say that uh, we are uh, sure, uh, we are convinced, we are confirmed that uh, we are 
uh, going to develop a fast reactor technology. And I already mentioned that we are uh, going uh, to have not only uh, sodium fast reactor, but also lead fast reactor. And uh, we have a big uh, program uh, in that area. Uh, we're developing new type of fuel, not only MOX uh, fuel, but also nitrate fuel. Uh, and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, programs. Uh, I mentioned also uh, France and uh, uh, US uh, program. They are continuing in that direction, uh, continue development in that direction. Uh, but uh, in case of in some country, uh, this program will be stopped. Uh, uh, we can, um, Russia and France uh, also uh, develop uh, the program with multi-recycling uranium plutonium fuel in existing. Uh, fleet, uh, NPP fleet, uh, which can provide uh, multiple recycling, also reprocessing and uh, recycling up to five, seven times. Uh, that also uh, give many, uh, many positive results uh, in reducing radiotoxicity and uh, reducing the high level waste to be disposed. Uh, as for uh, transmutation uh, system, uh, uh, exist uh, different approaches uh, besides a fast reactor, for example, multiple salt uh, conception, uh, which can uh, transmute um, minor actinine and uh, uh, accelerated driven system also. Uh, so, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, there is another plan, but uh, we are can, uh, we are sure that uh, our technology uh, mature now and can be developed uh, in the uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, any more coming in, uh, Jeff? No. Okay. Thank you very much. Let me also just give another chance to the room here, those who are with us. Anyone here have a question that they would like to pose to one of our panel members? Sorry, I'm, oh, there we go. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is to- Just remind us who you are, uh, uh, yeah. in case the, our panel wasn't there yesterday, so they yeah, may not thank know. thank you. Uh, good morning, my name is Amir Manzoor from the Permanent Mission of Pakistan in Vienna. Uh, my question is uh, to Dr. Rebecca from UK. Uh, well, Dr. Rebecca uh, talked about uh, the national policy of uh, having wet storage for a period of like 80 years. So uh, we very well understand, uh, as she explained also, uh, some of the benefits that might be uh, seen by the national policy holders uh, but my question was that uh, we are talking about uh, spread of uh, uh, fuel throughout the country. We are also talking about regulatory issues. We are also talking about the monitoring issues. We are also talking about the operating issues. And the active components are involved in such a long period of time. So uh, the question that comes to mind is, uh, uh, what are the real merits, for example, if they will be directly going to the deep geological storage from the wet storage? Thank you. So the, the, the context in the, in the UK uh, is really that uh, it's wet storage for advanced gas called um, reactor fuel. And, and much of that is, is really we have an existing uh, facility in the, the Thorpe Restore Storage Pond. And I, I think in, in terms of uh, the context of sustainability that we've been talking about um, today, uh, while it would seem that uh, it takes more energy to, to store um, material um, wet uh, for a period of time, the fact that we're reusing an existing uh, facility rather than building new uh, actually over the life cycle uh, means a uh, reduced um, 
the carbon emission um, footprint for, for that. So, so that's that's one of the um, the, the benefits of uh, of that route um, as well. As in, in terms of um, wet versus dry, I mean, I think that's that's very much um, a contextual um, choice for for different um, for different nations, and as um, as as described, uh, really does depend on uh, what are the commitments to um, geological disposal or a, a long term uh, disposal solution for the for the fuel um, and uh, the use of the the spent fuel ponds for um, a, a period in, in time allows some flexibility um, with regard to uh, that choice uh, for, for different nations. I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. And thank you to all of our speakers for being with us for this very, very interesting discussion. And that does bring our session three to an end. So let's give all of them a very warm round of applause, please. Thanks for being with us live.